Okay, cool. All right. Let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason. I teach at the University of Idaho. Actually, I'm having a little silly slide that's not working. That's me. I teach uh, a lot of things, a lot of things, as mentioned in uh, previous um, uh, presentations. Um, as a music teacher, most of you know, you get hired to do one thing, and then you do another thing. Right, so I was hired to do horn, and as my contract states, other. Um, <laughs> so it turns out I am now the concert band director, and I also teach brass techniques. And um, the and don't get me wrong, I've I've over three the last three years or so, I've learned to fall in love with band, um, or fall in deep like with band. <laughs> but uh, brass techniques, I've really um, really enjoyed wrapping. Uh, my head around this and trying to figure out what to do. When I was first presented with the job, I was given one of those four-inch binders just full of paper. Thunk. There you go. And being the 21st century, I was like, this is not going to work. Um, and I, I just decided, all right, I gotta, we got to do something. And even as it was just creating stuff for my students and eventually creating online resource. So what I want to present to you guys today is sort of the not necessarily, not necessarily the infancy, but more the, the toddler toddlerness of this project, where it's growing a little bit. Um, but it, it's about the embouchure. And when, with brass techniques, techniques, I was talking to my buddy Rob, who, who we've known for twenty some odd years, twenty four years. We've been good friends, and um, he's being a trombone player, I'm a horn player, so we have these high brass, low brass arguments, um, and. I'm really glad we do because I, it, it proves that I really need to provide a lot of clarity to my students because our amateurs are not the same. It's just not, yeah, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but creating the foundation of the brass amateur is basically the first two weeks of my brass tech course. And we don't touch an instrument for a while because they have to really get a good idea of what's happening and how their face reacts with their airstream. Okay, this is one of my favorite. Uh, quotes, uh, the amateur is not a static mechanical construction, it is a flexible, dynamic relationship of bone, muscle, and flesh that we allow to respond to varying air speed and pressure. Written by uh, Fergus McWilliam, he wrote a great uh, method book called um, Blow Your Own Horn, that's the uh, anti-method method book. Uh, he purpose, not, oh, he tried to just be gone with normal ways of teaching and play put air through the horn and play. And I really want to take that and run, but there are some rules that we have to look at and ways of constructing the face to make it work with specific mouthpieces. And what I want to provide is some sort of, well, is a resource for all of you and me. Like, I, I want to provide this to you, and then you can provide feedback, like, Jason, you are way wrong on the tuba thing. Let's talk. You know what I mean? And we should have some sort of similar way of speaking to the music educators that we have to throw out into the communities with all the stuff that they have to do. One thing you can do is at least provide something that is um, reliable. And um, these are a lot of things I've collected over the years. So starting with um, uh, the flesh, sorry. So we have, or the components that we're going to talk about today, bone, muscle, flesh, and air. Um, when it comes to the bone structure, you guys know this, you're all professional musicians. One thing I really want to bring to your uh, attention when it comes to brass playing is the thing called a pivot point. Um, we will dig a little deeper into that in about five or ten minutes or so. But one thing, um, if you do or if you are thrown into a brass techniques class and you are um, not necessarily a trumpet player uh, or a high, or high or even horn, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, on low brass yet, I need to have more discussions with my colleagues, but your your front teeth drive where you put your mouthpiece. And a lot of public school educators don't know that. Um, if you have one tooth in front of the other, it is vital that you put the mouthpiece over that tooth. Um, we can get involved with a lot of physics and airspeed and biology, but the reason being it frees up your aperture. Um, and actually, if I've had students come in with the mouthpiece on the wrong side, and as soon as they move it over, it adds a force to their hand. It's really um, quite amazing. We call it a pivot point, or I call it a pivot point, and we'll dig into it a little bit more here in a minute. 
Um, this video, some of you have seen, some of you may not have seen. I want to play a few seconds of it. Um, I'm not sure if the audio is going to work, but it's more visual here for me. Anyway, this is a horn player, and he's just going up and down. And what, what I want you to see is the bottom teeth here, how it goes under the mouthpiece on the horn. The horn has to cover four octaves minimum. Uh, similar to a trombone, right? It's the same length of instrument. Um, but with the really, really teeny, itsy bitsy mouthpiece, we have to really get involved with what's going on with our jaw, okay? And then when you compare it to a trumpet, as you see in a trumpet player, he's doing the same thing, going up two octaves two and a half, and his job doesn't move. No jaw movement whatsoever with the trumpet, okay? Um, their mouthpiece directs how the lips are gonna to react to the airstream they provide. And with the trumpet player, you cannot move, or you should not move, you can move, you should not move. Whereas horn, you have to. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Moving on. Muscles. Um, I, I've been uh, arguing with myself over oh, quite a while now. How deep do I want to get into a subject with a young person? Paralysis by analysis. Right? Um, I think talking a little bit about it is really important. And I had a lesson yesterday, uh, two days ago, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So these five muscles uh, are primarily doing uh, the greatest amount of work in creating the eye. Uh, the opicularis oris, I call the elbow muscle, because I mean, this is the thing, oh, oh, like, you know, you, you can move that in all kinds of different ways. Uh, the depressor anguli, I call it the pencil muscle. So if you guys could do me a favor and, you know, say the letter M firmly, and if you go straight down from your corners and feel, you should have, uh, or, or I do, uh, and, and for me, I think for being a breast player, you got a really strong, a really thick muscle right here. If you aren't a brass player or a wind player, it'll be very flat. Okay, wind players will have this thing because it's part of the, the creation. It's the depressor angle eye. I call it the pencil muscle because it's about as round as a pencil. It's quite a big muscle. Okay, um, and you'll notice that your young students, your first year, second year students, when you have that do them, uh, do that to themselves, have them poke around a little bit. They're like, can you do this? It's like, yeah, it's, it's fine. It's flat because you don't use it as a wind player would use it. Um, and then the zygomaticus, the bunny muscle. Um, I had a great discovery with a student two days ago, Derek Rinsman. Um, he, uh, so if you guys can not laugh when you do this, but try to get your upper lip to go down by pushing from here so it looks like this. It's just a very slight movement, but it's this idea. That's the bunny muscle, you know. Um, I call it the bunny muscle. It's um, for low horn playing, you got to shove your upper lip in your mouthpiece a little bit more. And by getting this involved, it creates this really ridiculous tubby sound, but it's a brand new sound they've never heard, heard and it's a sound that they can develop. Right? It's usually it's like no sound at all, and they cap out at a low F when they need to go uh, at least a fourth below that. And if you get that involved, they they toss out this ginormous, really kind of a horrible sound, but it's a really tubby big sound, but it's a fourth-ish lower than they were playing a moment ago. And it, there's so many things you can do as a teacher with these three muscles in your brass pep class. Like, okay, Elvis. First you have to tell them who Elvis is, because they don't know. <laughs> That's a bummer. <laughs> and then talk about this idea of the roundness of the pencil and then the bunny muscle. And you can get them to do these things, and you can get you can get them to do it on their instruments. Now, again, it's really hard to do this one for trumpet, but there's a different way to go about it. And I'll and talk, I call it uh, coffee straw, I like, I like to think, coffee straw crushing, which we'll get to. Uh, more on in the flesh, more on into the flesh. The vermilion border, okay, the ridge. It's flesh tissue, that, it's a ridge that separates the flesh tissue from the lip tissue, okay. Um, placement, placement. That particular border is crucial in young brass playing. Okay, 
If, if anything that my students can take from my brass tech class is this one thing. It will fix every horn player problem and every trumpet player problem, high brass especially. Low brass, due to the size of the mouthpiece, especially the tuba, it's less of an issue, but even on trombone, if you're getting it way too high, it's a problem. Um, at least that's my understanding. I see lots of trombone players. Please tell me if I'm right. Please, please, please. Um, wet versus dry. So this one, unfortunately, the only picture I could find was the bottom lip, but you can see wet versus dry, right? You have the wet part of your lip and the dry part of your lip. Um, I mean, you can get all terminology on your students, but you can just say trick chat part versus wet part. The wet part of your lip does not buzz well, okay? Um, the dry part does, but it's actually a balance between the two. It's how the two react to the air spring. And the dry part is going to keep the wet part in check unless you totally give out here and then, then it's all, it's going to be all wet and you get this really airy, airy white noise sound and you're going to be missing a lot of notes, especially on initial attacks for high brass instruments. Okay, air, you're all musicians, you agree. This is my favorite um, ism, how to. Okay, just don't stop here. You guys know all these things, but my students don't, and they're like, whoa, what? <laughs> yes, don't stop your air. Um, oh, the second point, too often stuff is simply in the way of the air stream. All right, tongue, teeth, and lips, especially the bottom lip. The bottom lip is always in the way, okay? Um, due to the time crunch of our Fun little class here. Uh, I, we can't get super uh, deep into this, but I'll provide you a little bit of a resource so that uh, if you have questions, please, please contact me or things to add. I would love it, seriously. Um, but you have to get your aperture into health. Okay, so I have a, I have a, a student who has been really struggling on the horn, um, and he's a great musician, and he's fed up. He's really, he's just, all of his lessons are just dark. But yes, he desperately needed an aperture shift. He needed different mouthpieces. Blah, blah, blah. We tried all this stuff last year. None of it worked. Okay, I said, stop. We're done. Stick to this. Be a musician. Um, but one thing I had to do was when, is just to simply blow with a, with a semi thermometer. Right? And what we noticed is that he blows to the right. Right? And it turns out that he was placed down the middle. So as soon as he moved into his right, his sound got a lot bigger. It didn't help his range yet, but his sound got a lot bigger. So just simple obs observations like that. So where are you blowing? Where's your aperture when you're buzzing? Because that could also be different. Um, but just getting your aperture in the right place with your mouthpiece is, uh, yeah, one of the most crucial things you can do. Okay, the six pillars of control. So I did a presentation, some of this stuff for, uh, you know, your high, the, the, the MEA of your state, right? So I had to come up with something catchy, so I apologize. But the, these six things are what are in charge of putting your aperture in its greatest um, and most efficient position, right? Uh, the two, two most commonly mentioned are the chin and the corners. Um, I tell my students, be like Eager, okay? Be like Eager. You gotta anchor your corners down, okay? Can you guys frown without pursing out your bottom lip? Okay. All my students do this. Or they'll literally do this. Am I doing it? Am I doing it? Like, no. This. Frown. Okay. Am I doing it? No. It, it's, it's, weird. it's weird, right? It's weird. But it's because they're focusing on it. But if they're in a, in a conversation where they're upset, they're like, you know, they start. Uh, they can do it. But getting to, to engage without playing an instrument is, is it's wild that they, they're just unable to do it. Uh, two most commonly overlooked ones. There's not a lot of talk about teeth, at least not enough, um, talk about teeth and jaw, and especially how the works, whoops, lips work, apologies. Um, uh, this, nat this idea of a naturally rolled in or firm, pliable M idea. So try to say the letter M for M, but firm. M. Now try it, but don't don't allow your top lip to go under your teeth, and right, and because if the top lip go under your teeth, that's a big no no. Um, it's it's worth saying because all I've, it's actually very little to do here in their community 
here. I'm trying to get them to corner to engage and or ping or whatever. Come up with some sort of M word. Um, it's just this idea. It's it's be as simply as you as simple as you can, but don't let them wrap their upper lip under their upper cape. It'll destroy everything. Uh, teeth and jaw. Slightly apart, you know these things. Follow the natural under underbite. Some students don't have an underbite. Or if they, they have a... Can't say that again. It should be overbite. That's terrible. Sorry. Underbite. So, some of my students do have an underbite, and you have to uh, guide them around that. The denter structure guides the mouthpiece placement. Look for a pivot point, right? Um, I have students coming in with gaps. I have students coming in, actually I have one student right now whose, whose top teeth are like this. It's a jaw problem, right? And, um, and I have um, students with um, uh, you know, a major underbite. So we all, we all have student problems. We all do. And all, all I want you to be aware of, or, if, or tell your friends, is just make sure you're taking the dental structure into account. By a large amount, the teeth have to guide the mouthpiece placement. Um, and that's just, a lot of that could be just trying to figure out, okay, last week, last week, last week, which I'll do in a minute. Um, the forgotten ones, cheeks, pressure, right? Cheeks need to be against the teeth. That's a good one, just keep your cheeks against the teeth. Um, and pressure, we have to use pressure. Um, there was a thing from the 50s through the 90s, basically, of like no pressure, especially at the Phil Parkes fan club for a while. Well, I mean, he would put his horn like on that table and just buzz without touching his horn. And that's ludicrous. And actually, there's documentation in an interview uh, later on in his life that he thought his method book did more harm than it did good. Um, he regretted a lot of things that he put in there, this being one of them. You have to use pressure. Just don't crush your teeth, right? You know, what trumpet and horn players like to call it is the octave key. You know, the hook key, the octave key. Like, stay away. Just, but you have to form a consistent seal. Yeah, you know, your teeth are so so important, um, and especially with a young person, their teeth change so much. Um, it's really hard to balance the sound versus uh, teeth placement, because I would actually tell you to um, just make sure that the mechanics are good and the sound is going to come. Because if you're starting, you know, what seventh sixth grade? Yay high, probably. Yay high. You know, and then when they're in high school, they're already here. Like my son, he's a teenager. He's taller than me. Um, so they absolutely grow a lot. And I think you just don't be too worried about how they sound. Just look out, look out for that closed off sound, the nasally sound, blah, blah. You, you know. All right, placement. Uh, okay, this is a little bit of class participation here. Um, the free bus. There is some tension in the brass world about using free butts. Uh, I think it's a, a vital tool to use to tell your student to to have your students figure out how the air and your lips react with each other. And it's important that you tell your students. As soon as your the air leaves the lips, literally one millimeter after here, the air is useless. It's not. There's nothing you can do with it. Okay. So the point of the interaction with the air stream is most vital. Um, and this is what I walk my brass tech students through, is simply by saying, again, simply, I'm saying this is not simple. Say M or dim, start blowing air slowly. Where does the aperture appear? I need to be doing this with a mirror. I have all my brass tech students do this with a mirror. And then bring the lips together until you can form a buzz. The hard part is that all of you, know, all of you are highly trained musicians on different instruments. It's really easy to engage everything right away and form your aperture. But I'd like you to try this, but put, uh, if you could put your hand in front of your face so you're not spitting on the person in front of you. That would be great. Um, but just start, you know, say M, and just start blowing, but try, like, the word pierce came to my mind, like, like piercing a balloon. This idea of just blowing and see if you can get a buzz to happen, but do it slowly. Bite down on the airstream with your lips. <laughs> Nice. And you'll notice it doesn't take a tremendous amount of effort to do it, but what, what tends to happen with my students is that they are, they're trying to become, clarinet seems to be the instrument of the day. They're trying to become great clarinetists or great uh, trumpet players, and they're, using, you know, they're always told, use more air. 
hate that phrase. Uh, but anyway, that, so they try to just power through it when they actually have to come with a much more relaxed approach. Like, the simplicity of a buzz, okay? Um, it's, it's, if, it's, if you get your students to kind of, all right, calm down, pretend you're in sixth grade, you've never done this before, pliable, right? Firm but pliable. The purpose of the mouthpiece, mouthpiece is to isolate flesh. Um, my students think I'm crazy, but I tell them that we are a reed instrument, okay? We use a lip reed. Ours is made, it's made out of flesh, it's not wood, okay? Um, they think I'm crazy, but it's true, right? It acts like a reed. We have to be able to control this. This is uh, so, so important. Uh, mouthpiece, skip. These are bad mouthpieces. Do I use them? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a great. I, I've got so I got. I have a picture of a truly. It's a it's a horn mouthpiece, but the bottom of the shank is square. How did you do that? Probably on purpose. Anyway, um, so just know the differences between your mouthpiece plate placements. These drawings are um, out of the Scott Wagner book. Uh, really fabulous, the, the guy, the brass playing, um, very deep book, a little too deep for my students, but that's okay. Um, so this is just a good reference of uh, just where to start. Yeah. Usually in the middle, horns, the being two third, one third is fine, but um, what I would rather talk about is like make sure the bottom vermilion border of a horn player is outside of the mouthpiece. It cannot be inside. The horns cover four octaves. They will never be able to play the bottom two octaves. But this inside the mouthpiece, it will never, ever, never work. I promise. Okay. Um, we're talking about the rolling, bearing your front teeth against your feet. Now you can do that and sing with it. And, and trying to figure out how to create the trumpet embouchure. It's so different than horn. So, so, so different. And it's really important for your students to understand that. Um, yay. No, no, finger. No, no, no. That's good. Um, okay. And then, and then low rise. Um, Different world, totally different world. Okay, um, most players for trombone tend to have an inclination towards additional upper mat, upper lip. Right, there's you tend to play this is what I've seen either middle, either in the in the middle or lower third. Um, Rob and I were discussing when people get to the lower quarter, it causes a problem. Right, for trombone playing, um, but, but also in tuba, the your nose is pretty much going to stop where you put the mouthpiece, okay? Um, but I've got some cool little bits here that I'm going to show you real quick. All right, so here's, I don't even need sound. Does anybody know how to run this? Well, at least you can hear my you can hear my speakers on my computer. Thank you, Leonard. Appreciate it. <laughs> but here's my attempt at here's the trumpet. Right? Lower third. But watch when it goes lower. Watch when it goes higher. High. Right? Oh, right in the middle. Now watch this. Way low. Right? Pretty fascinating, right? How, how the trumpet armature works. Okay. Okay. Nose hairs. Awesome. Okay. Good. Now here's the horn. And you'll notice two distinct differences right off the bat. More nose hair. What do you already see in this video? What's that? Teeth, right? And one more thing. I mentioned it earlier. Um, look at, look. Right, tons of upper lip, tons of the wet part, right? It's that balance of wet dry. It's right where that ridge is that does the work and creates that balance, right? Way lower third. Even lower fourth for horn, right? 
Everything. The trombone is really gross. <laughs> the players are gross. <laughs> it's true. Every slow ever. motion. Tons of the wet part of the lip, right? Tons of, and the bottom lip, right? Now, you'll notice that um, on both horn and trumpet, the, um, the bottom lip buzzes due to sympathetic vibration. Like, it's, that's so gross, I know. But in front of the buzz, <laughs> like I can push on my bottom lip. Right? So the top lip does a predominant amount of buzzing. Right, compared to the bottom. Here, it's very different. The bottom lip is way involved. That's so nice. Boom! Moving on. Oh, that was trying to work. One more. This is great. This is just good. Uh oh. You can see as it goes higher, just. This is what, yeah, like, you got to clamp down on the airstream. Everyone's too worried about powering forward and getting through and putting air through the horn. And blow, blow that candle out, you know, 10 yards away. When we need to be here, we have to be here. We have to be here. And too much attention is, is blowing through the horn rather than blowing through the aperture. And that's, um, I think, the, the biggest takeaway, the second biggest take, takeaway, my students is to go about working on the aperture. Now, I have a whole other section, but I'm out of time. Um, you guys have any, any questions about this? Any any thoughts? Well, that's friends, especially. Um, uh, please, I, I love talking to you about Paul. If you want to shoot me an email, I'm always looking for ways to tweak this. Um, if not, thank you for your time. It was my pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming. Thank you.